Episode 234, The Complexity is the Joy. This is the World Organic News for the week ending 4th of October 2020. John Moore reporting. Decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. The more I dig into this no dig thing, no pun intended, the more it becomes opaque and at the same time becomes crystal clear. It's a thing I like to call the Fukuoka Paradox. Masanobu Fukuoka of the One Straw Revolution talks about this in one of the later chapters of the One Straw Revolution. He'd set up his system for a few years, sowing before reaping, allowing fruit trees to grow as central leaders, and then not pruning them and loading his orchard soil with food crop seeds to allow them to work out their own rotations when he was approached by ag scientists. Now, I'm not going to quote the book, but the gist of it went something like this. One day, the chemical for one year, the chemical farmers were having trouble with, say, rice stem borers, and he wasn't. The scientists would come and measure everything, and they would try to discover why rice stem borers were not an issue on his place. Then they'd go away and write up their papers. The next year, they'd come to discover why a different pest wasn't attacking his rice, but was attacking chemical farmers' rice, and so on. The point he was trying to make was that reductionist science, if this then that, linear thinking if you prefer, would never understand the system he'd set up. And remember, Fukuoka trained as one of these agricultural scientists before he set up his own system. To live with the Fukuoka paradox is to accept that there will be things happening in the ecosystem of the garden farm that we will not understand. We must rely upon the three billion odd years of evolution to do the right thing. And this can be infuriating for an inquiring mind and liberating for an inquiring mind at the same time. The paradox has many levels. Let's look at the principles of Fukuoka and then some that I humbly submit for your consideration. There are basically five with Fukuoka. No digging tillage. No weeding, no fertilisers, no pesticides, and no pruning. As we can see from these principles, they are a list of things not to do, which sort of fits in with his what less can I do uh, theories. My principles are no digging, no bare soil, companion planting, the greater the variety of plants per unit area of land, the better, observe and listen to your soils and plants, I will readily concede my principles are nowhere near as elegant as as Fukuoka's. Obviously, points one and two are the same as his. Points three and four I've arrived at from readings of Dr Christine Jones, Dr Charles Massey and the coursework at the University of Tasmania Science of Gardening course. There's links to all of those in the show notes. Those influences are my own observations, in fact. And a sort of part of the revelation that came to me some years back were about biological systems being more stable with complexity. Just sort of counterintuitive to the, the mechanical understanding of things. To put all this to the test, so to speak, I've knocked up a five year rotation plan here at home. At this stage, there are still a couple of holes in the, the rotation. That is, periods in the year on parts of the land where I don't have any allocated crops. These are four to six week windows, and I'm trying to find a buckwheat supply here in Tasmania, as it's a prohibited import into the state for biosecurity reasons. I could import some, but the cost of it being tested by Biosecurity Tasmania would be economically prohibitive, because I probably only need a kilo or so of the stuff. The search continues for either a supplier or an alternative crop to fill those gaps. The really good thing I like about buckwheat, and I've grown it before, well there's good things, there's two really, Uh, buckwheat is really quickly growing cultivar and it is destroyed by frosts. So I could plant through it in autumn, securing the knowledge that the soil will be covered until the first frost, by which time a winter crop, probably barley or broadbeans or something, would be sufficiently large to cover the ground. 
The other frost-sensitive cereals that might fill the gap are subject to the same biosecurity issues, although I suppose I could use a form of uh, sweet corn. There will be an answer, I just haven't found it yet. If you've got any suggestions, email me, john at worldorganicnews.com. That's John without an H. And there's a link in the show notes, so you just have to click through. The fifth principle is what makes this way of food production so much fun. There's no recipe to follow, as in the chemical system. You know, this seed plus this much water at these times, and this much fertiliser and these pesticides, and Bob's your uncle, money in, time, money out. The money in, when we're attempting to create change underground, is minimal. I heard of corn growers in the US who plant in effect $800,000 and hope to harvest 850000 Their inputs are that expensive and their returns so low. In that case, reducing import costs to say 1% of the 800,000, that is 8,000, and only pulling 100,000 out in harvest would be a much better financial situation and would lead to far fewer sleepless nights, I imagine. But such low inputs will never feel that feed the world, I hear people complain. Well, I just heard of a calculation that went something like this. If we were to provide every man, woman and child on the planet a kilo of corn per person per day for a year, could we do it? Now it turns out the fellow who asked this question discovered it could be done with the corn harvest from his county in Kansas. The world doesn't have a food shortage, it lacks the will to feed everyone, rant over. So any feedback on those principles I've put together would be gratefully accepted. Use the email in the show notes, but not while you're driving. Remember, our underlying focus must be to decarbonise the air and recarbonise the soil. Thank you all so much for listening, and I'll be back next week.